morning. Good morning. And welcome to this morning's worship service. Uh, we have a few announcements. Uh, the first is I, I do want to thank everyone who's involved with the um, fall sale. Uh, it was uh, it was okay, I guess, not, not not necessarily great, but I don't know what they're going to end up deciding and what to do with that in the in the future. But nonetheless, all the people that were so helpful in that, I want to thank you very much. And Judy and Brenda particularly want to thank you for that. Um, Bob Courtney is gravely ill, and uh, those of you who remember Bob and were friends with him uh, would want to hold him in your prayers, and uh, we'll see how he fares through yet again another um, siege that he is uh, suffering from. Speaking about sieges, uh, Ruth Young was admitted to the hospital on Friday and for most of the day, and she, as you well know, is getting a little older and a little more frail, and uh, you need to be uh, thinking about her. And she's not remembering things as well as she used to. So you want to think about Ruth, and of course, Ralph has to take care of her. So those of you who have occasion to uh, minister uh, to the young, you would want to do that, I would think. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes, Alan, peace. Judy and Brenda would like everybody to know that they left up most of the sale items downstairs, so during fellowship hour you can shop. Sure. <laughs> that's, no, that's exactly right. And also, I don't know when, but probably soon, won't it, Alan B. will put the uh, uh, mitten tree up and the cap and mitten tree up maybe fairly soon, because obviously it doesn't do a whole lot of good if we're going to give it to them in uh, January. When, when they probably could be using uh, caps and mittens uh, yesterday, as I could have, so. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Yesang Na for uh, being our pianist and uh, grateful for the work that he does. If there are no other announcements, then we'll begin our worship in silence. I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. Words of the great apostle Paul, found in the book of Philippians chapter 4. So we're happy this morning, we're here to worship God. God is here to be worshipped. Let us begin. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has lined his ear to me. Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. 
I suffer distress and anguish. Then and I call on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous our God is merciful. Let us stand and sing together hymn 262, God of the Ages, whose almighty hand.
Good. Where's your brother? Is he here today? He's downstairs babysitting. Oh, he is. Good for him. He's taking care of your brother. Well, that's nice. Hey, I listened to somebody. Well, let me ask you this. What do you think are the most important words that a human being can say? Yeah, you looked at this, didn't you? <laughs> you did too. Did you look at this? No. Nah. Look at me. Did you look at the children's sermon title? <coughs> you know what it means to not tell the truth? <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Well, anyway, yeah, help me is really important. Two, I, I listened to a woman on TV years ago and said two most important words in the human language, I'm not sure if I agree with her on that, but uh, they're certainly important. Help me. So when you say help me, what does that mean, Tomas? What? Oh, well, you want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't need help. <laughs> well, then don't answer to the children. Because <laughs> uh, where was I? Yeah, so why would you say help me? If you're in trouble. Or if you're stuck. So if you're a small or maybe not a grown-up person, who do you ask to help you? God. Okay, and who else do you ask to help you? A friend or a teacher. Okay, let me let me help you with this. The reason God gave you parents <laughs> is if you need. What if you're at school? If you're, if you're at school, then you go to locus parentis. Ah, gotcha, didn't I? <laughs> well, it means that the school is supposed to act <laughs> like your parents when your parents are there. So your teachers and your principals will sort of act like your parents. So you're exactly right. If you have trouble at school, then you go to your teacher or to somebody that you respect, and they will help you, okay? But when we say help me, it means that we don't have something. What does it mean we don't have? Well, maybe you're stuck on power. Yeah. Well, it means you don't have power. Yeah. And uh, if you don't have power, then you get in trouble. And sometimes, if you don't have power, you can get in a lot of trouble. Okay. Now, one of the things as you grow older, you learn how to help yourself. And it's very important that you do that and not have other people take care of you when you get older. And I won't go to political commentary on that. But it's important that as we get older, we learn to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our families and so that we can take care of people who need help. But it's very important. Now, also, though, when we get older, sometimes there are things that we can't take care of, even though we might be strong, or we might be smart, or we might have money, we might have power, but it's things that happen to us, to our souls, okay? And so who do you suppose we have to talk to when we have things in our hearts that are right? And, and if it's really troublesome, we have to say, help me, Jesus. Help me, God. And the thing that's important is that God does listen. And if you listen to what God tells you, then you get the help you need. That's something that's difficult for all people to understand, big people as well as smaller people. But it is true. Now, uh, is anybody going to help help me see today? Who's going to help me see? <laughs> Think of that. We say it's not your what? Really? But what does that have to do about singing Hosanna? <laughs> I'm not going to sing because it's not my word. Okay. <laughs> All right. Play through it once.
Sing today. Let's sing we it should, today. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Garrett. Happy birthday to you. How are you? Wow, 14 years old. He's taller than me. Well, he's taller than me. Well, happy.
happy birthday. That's great. Proud of you. Really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, song, thank you for your playing. That was very beautiful. Really appreciate that very much. Turn out our pastoral concerns and ask if there's any one or ones that we need to lift up today um, in prayer. Yes? I've got a chance to look at the gale lift it up. Okay. He's having just a little bit of problem with getting the platelets, so she didn't have the chemo. Okay. But she's feeling fine. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes. My, my mom, Cece. Medical oh, stuff. I haven't seen Cece forever. She says hi, by the way. <laughs> Anyone else? Right. Then let's turn our attention to prayer. Gracious and heavenly God, we thank you for this splendid morning. It's a harbinger of the cold and the snow and the sleet to come. And that's all right. It's part of being fully alive, and it's just fine. Give thee thanks for this uh, autumnal season, for this rather beautiful time we've had this year, with the colors and the breezes and the warm weather. We thank you for all of that. We thank you that people have been able to take more time than usual uh, on their weekends for times of refreshment, renewal, and travel. And we ask blessings upon each of those people and that they might uh, return uh, to this sacred place um, soon. We ask blessings upon those members of this fellowship and friends of this fellowship whose bodies are not well. <clears throat> we lift up to you, of course, Bob Courtney, longtime member and friend of you and uh, this fellowship, and we ask that you abide with him in this time of preparation that he's going through. As we ask that you be with your servant, your long friend of 99 years, Ruth Young, and your long friend of 91 years, uh, Harlan Parmenter, and that you abide with them and with Ralph of 98 years, and that you call their name daily. <clears throat> and that they hear uh, their name being spoken by you. And I would ask that all distractions be taken from them so that they can hear your love. We ask that you be with Gail as she continues uh, her treatment for cancer. <clears throat> and ask that you abide with her and see her through this siege. Always that you be with your servant and your friend, uh, uh, Jim McCartney and with his beloved Virginia uh, as they both uh, work through health issues always abide with Kathleen Olds and uh, the challenges that she has um, before her and abide with her mother as well. As it should be with John Swanson as you continually restore him to the fullness of health and we would ask that you be with his beloved sister as she battles cancer as well. My friend Cece, ask that you be with her and bring her this fellowship soon and abide with her family and her, her beloved husband and restore her to good health. I ask that you be in uh, Jordan with Lena Lisa. I'm grateful for the healing that is happening with her, that you be with her family, and let them be not dismayed, but rather rejoice in the progress that's being made. Indeed, let no one be frightened, for in Jesus Christ there is no fear. Let no one be discouraged about the future, for those in Jesus Christ the future has been taken care of. Let no one be concerned about judgment, for in Jesus Christ there is no judgment. There is only joy. 
but I ask that you abide with all peoples whose hearts are not where they need to be today, that those who are filled with bitterness and ignorance um, and sorrow, that all of that would be taken from them and that they would be restored to a proper and good and healthy relationship with you. Gracious and heavenly God, we ask that you abide with our friends throughout the world, and we ask that you be with us as we speak these sweet words to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much, and we continue now with the sharing of our tithes and our offerings. <coughs> from our hands and from our hearts our tithes, our offerings that they might be blessed by you and used for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we present them and in whose name we pray Amen scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. You will find uh, information in your bulletin about where to find that in the Pew Bible and also in the large print Bible. John chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for they also had been there. 
Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. <coughs> when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you'll never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. <coughs> Jesus replied, You may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him, and with the news that the boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he, he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Thank you, Reverend. Appreciate that, always. As we begin to lead up to Advent, the Advent season, uh, which begins on the 27th of November, I thought it might be instructive as well as enjoyable to preach about the so-called uh, miraculous signs of Jesus as revealed in the first six chapters of uh, John. One th uh, theologian, C.H. Dodd, called this section the uh, Book of Signs which I think is interesting, that, that little area there. And, and, and it really is kind of a fun read and, uh, and an enjoyable read. And if you recall, last week we start, started with the first sign, and that was the, the sign that was received there at Cana <clears throat> when the, the water was uh, turned into wine. And to bring people back up to speed on that, um, because what I think we're going to do is there are five of these signs, we've done one, We'll, we'll do them um, all the way up till the 20th, I think, something like that. And then we're going to take a couple, we're going to take a Sunday off because we have an important baptism to do in the middle of uh, November, and we're looking forward to that. If you recall, little Samuel um, Khan is going to be uh, baptized. So that's, that's exciting. Anyway. What I wanted to do then is to, is to talk about these signs, there are five of them. We talked about the first sign or miracle last week, and that was the turning the water into wine. And what I wanted to do was to just spend a moment on that once more. We, we have here in the, um, in the window stained glass um, presentation of that miracle. And if you look there are the stone jars and then the water uh, as it's being poured out in this case very symbolically turning to uh, wine and then in my interpretation turning to blood. Before you could go into a wedding ceremony you had to uh, wash your hands and you had to uh, become uh, ritually pure and, and, and clean and that then was the, the um, agency, the water then, was the agency that gained you admittance then into the, um, the celebration and into the, the party, if you will, uh, the wedding party, and uh, united you uh, with, with the people that were there. All right? Now what Jesus does is he takes the, 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 the stoneware, which is usually used for purification, that you um, um, 
clean yourself with and that gains you in entry that, that what Jesus does is he, he, he turns the water into wine and so it's the wine that's the agency that gains you entry then into meeting up with who is in fact the true um, uh, groom or bride's groom of Israel and, and that would be Jesus. And so that the followers of, of Jesus end up being the new Israel. Remember? And so uh, what you have is in this miracle, which I do believe happened, what you have then is that wine, which sacramentally is also blood, and that ends up being the, 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 the way that we enter into this communion, this sacred fellowship then with Jesus. And I'm pretty sure that's what the, uh, or at least certainly in part, what that first miracle is about. Now, of course, some people want to, to, to spend time on the miracle, and I, and I don't have, I personally believe it happened, but I don't personally think that that's <clears throat> what we're supposed to be spending time on, but rather asking ourselves, what does the miracle teach us about our relationship with God? And that's what's important. Now, following this episode uh, in chapter 2, Jesus begins to share his message then uh, of who he is and what he's about with, with other people. It's interesting how he does this. If you recall, he begins at Cana with a Jewish audience, and then he starts spreading out, and he goes into the, to the region of Samaria, and once again, um, you have Galilee up here, and you have this big area here called Samaria, and then down at the bottom, you have Judah, an area called Judah, in which there is Jerusalem. Now, Samaria uh, happened as a result of the army of Sennacherib from Assyria in about the year 721 BC, obviously, coming over into the, the what was called the Northern Kingdom, uh, killing just about everybody, killing the intelligentsia, but not the women. And so Sennacherib takes the women of this area of Israel and interbreeds with them, not Sennacherib himself, but the people, and a, and a new a capital is established, and the people who end up living there in this area are called Samaritans. Okay? And they worship on a, and toward a particular mountain. And they, in, in effect, are, um, this is an ugly word, but they're, let's not make it ugly, they're half Jewish and half Assyrian or pagan. Okay? And, and as such, they're considered people that, that uh, respectful Jews um, don't want to be around. And so, um, you know the story, if you walk through uh, Samaria, you can, you can be subject to being robbed or killed or beaten up. And <clears throat> so the Jews naturally want to go around it and then come in from, uh, into Judah from a different way instead of coming straight down. So Jesus, now get this, Jesus is, remember we've talked about holiness and purity quite a bit. Now what Jesus is doing now, we'll back up. If you want to be holy, who do you have to stay away from? Samaritans. Samaritans, in other words, unholy people. If you want to be pure before God, who do you have to stay away from? Impure people, right? If you want God to love you, you can't become unholy, right? If you don't want to become unholy, that means you can't be around. Who, Andy? Unholy, Un unholy people. Because unholy people will do what to you, Andy? Um. Okay. Stain you. They'll stain you. They'll contaminate you. So we got to be holy before God because it says in Scripture, be you holy because our God is a holy God. And therefore, you can't be around people who are unholy, who are impure. And you certainly can't let them in your fellowship because if you let something that's a contagion into your fellowship, what happens to it? It starts spreading that unholiness, and so you no longer have a happy, holy um, um, environment. 
environment, but rather one that's polluted. Thank you. Okay, I was up too late last night. <laughs> now this is important. First, Jesus is with the chosen people who are trying their best to be holy. Now what Jesus is doing is he who is, is Jesus holy? Yes. Wait a minute. How can that be? How can it be that the Holy One of God who demands purity, who, who demands holiness, who demands righteousness, who demands whatever, how come He gets to be around unholy people? Because that's the way it is. So Jesus, who is holy, He ends up going down into Samaria and starts giving the people the good news. That's an instructive lesson for people who want to keep unholy people out of their fellowship. So Jesus meets the woman at the well. Wonderful story. How many times has she been married? Five or six. Well, four. And the woman, and the woman, the man that she's living with now is not her husband, right? And there's a great song by Ian and Sylvia, those of you who like people north of the border in Canada. Uh, it's called Jesus Met the Woman at the Well by Ian and Sylvia. They were a folk group back in the 60s and 70s. Splendid, splendid song. I won't sing it for you, but it's Jesus met the woman in the well and he told her everything that she done done. And he said, woman, woman, where is your husband? I ought to sing it. Woman, woman, where is your husband? And it goes on. It's an absolutely splendid song. You can find it, I'm sure, on whatever they call those things. <laughs> YouTube. Is it YouTube? Whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> so he meets the woman at the well, uh, reveals who she is, and uh, in the revealing of who she is, then she starts to begin to know who, who, who he is in her relationship with her, and she starts to figure out that he is the Holy One of God. Now, you've got to understand this. <clears throat> Here, the Holy One of God is in an environment that is unholy. So that kind of shoots that whole notion uh, that if you want to be holy, you have to only be around holy people. I'm kind of of the opinion if you want to be around, if you want to be Christian, then you have to be around people who are not holy. Jesus meets a woman at the well, tells her everything that she'd done, and, uh, and he says, how many times have you been married? Four. And he says, that is true, and the, one, and the man you're living with now. And she says, you know who I am. Of course, Jesus reveals who we are when we encounter him. And that's important. Now, what's happening, watch this. What's happening is that uh, um, Jesus goes to Samaria. Jesus meets the woman at the well. And now the message of Jesus is spreading out uh, from beyond the holy ones of God, namely the Jews. Now it's including uh, religious half-breeds. And, uh, and that's the, the Samaritan woman. And that's the background then of the second sign or miracle of Jesus the passage that Bob read today. Now, I can't say this for certain, and I've not been able to find it anywhere for certain, but it seems to me that the royal official was a Gentile, in other words, a non-Jew. So the movement then that you have is Jesus first um, is with the chosen people, the pure people, if you will, the Jews. Then Jesus expands his ministry, and now he's with half Jews, half pagans. And now what he's done, he's expanded his ministry even farther, and now he's going to include people who are Gentiles, in other words, not part of the promise of God. Now mind you, this is the Holy One of God who's doing this, and so he comes into the company and he comes into the presence, Jesus does, in Cana, and that's interesting, where the first miracle, the first sign was. And what you find now is the widening then of Jesus' influence and and his audience, and what he's really trying to accomplish. And this is so important, it seems to me, and I don't want to digress, but it seems to me that what we do in churches, and certainly in denominations, is we try and is, is make everybody like everybody else. And we only want to get our own kind. And then we make our own determinations about who's pure, and about who's good, and about who's righteous, and about who should be acceptable before God. 
And then we might as well put out these signs in front of our churches to say, this kind of person's not welcome. This kind of, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? This kind of person's not welcome. This kind of person's not welcome. This kind of person's not welcome. Why? Because we're pure and we're, if pure is the driven snow, I'm not talking about us, because anybody's welcome here and evidence of that is mine here. Um, well, it's the truth. <clears throat> um, so anyway, what's interesting about this is that the official seeks out Jesus. Not for his own good does he do this. But he does it to save his boy. This is real important. His motivation is not driven by any selfishness that's coming from his heart. He's coming there to save his little boy. That's what he's trying to do. And so he wants Jesus to do this. And Jesus responds in what certainly seems harsh language, and he says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him then, you will never believe. These words reveal a criticism of the people, I might add, of anyone for that matter, who before they can or will believe, they have to have proof. Interestingly enough, I suppose you know this, it doesn't quite translate that well, but in the Greek, the word you is plural. So he's saying you people, meaning uh, the Galileans, okay? And it's almost as, as, as if Jesus is speaking to those gathered around him, and maybe not the official, but I'm not sure about that. But the end result is that when, when anybody asks for proof about something, uh, you know, show us a miracle, give us a sign, that's an indication of a lack of what? Faith. Faith. <coughs> so once again, they're condemning themselves out of their own lips. To ask for an act of faith or act a, 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 a miracle or a sign condemns your own self that you don't have the faith to begin with. Now what's fascinating about this story, and I find really tender, and I, 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 I could really get, if I wanted to preach a really emotional sermon, this would be one of them that I teach on. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but uh, in itself, it's just a sweet, sweet story. Now, um, the father, uh, after hearing these excoriating words from Jesus, fair enough. But what does this royal official do? Better yet, how does he respond to these words if in fact that's what he's responded to in the first place? And even if we could include him in Jesus' sharp criticism, what this guy does is remarkable. It's like he, he doesn't, he, he, he's not interested in what Jesus is saying uh, for whatever reason. It just rolls right off of him. He's not offended. He's not, he, he's not hurt. He's, his feelings aren't, haven't gotten um, in the way. His ego has not been bruised because what he is concerned about is not himself but whom? who he's trying to save. That's what he's trying to do. Save his boy. So the criticism is whatever. It's deflected or it doesn't apply or whatever. And so the father, he, a Gentile, not a recipient of the promises of God, removed from purity, removed from holiness, might even be a Roman citizen. He, and not the Gentiles, he responds in faith and not in any need for a sign or a miracle. 
That's how, how he responds. He doesn't need that. What he needs is for his boy to live. He doesn't need a miracle. He needs his boy to live. And so he says to Jesus, Sir, come before my child dies. He trusts Jesus. Now, I'm not going to do it, but I think you understand how so many of us need proof and we need miracles and we, and, and, and we go to books and, and, and commentaries and we say, oh, you know, this, this book proves that there was Noah's Ark. What does that have to do with my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? I don't believe in Jesus Christ because there was or was not a Noah's Ark. People say, well, I was reading a commentary and it proves the Garden of Eden. It was in Dilmun, which is in southern Iraq. Well, great. What does that have to do with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Nothing. I don't need a miracle to prove that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. If you need a miracle, you don't have any faith. If you need a miracle, you're deficient. If you need a miracle, you're not seeing it. You're not trusting. People use the word belief. I'm not keen on that one. I like the idea of trust. I like that idea of trust. Anyway. Uh, the Father trusts Jesus at His Word. I like that. He trusts Jesus at His Word. And the boy lives. And what to make of this? In a splendid commentary I have uh, referred to on occasion, uh, it's called St. John by a fellow named a really good theologian uh, called John Marsh. He's not a minister. Probably why he's a good theologian. Uh, I'm serious. Um, he correctly, I think correctly, notices the following that when we encounter the real Jesus, now the real Jesus, not the make-believe Jesus, not the pretty Jesus, not the, the Jesus that makes us feel good, or for that matter, the Jesus that condemns us and shakes that bony finger at us. And, and that when, you, when, you, when you encounter the real Jesus, you have two options. And, and this is really important, the real Jesus, not the make-believe Jesus. When you encounter the real Jesus, you have two options, according to Marsh, and he's right. Um, you can respond to Jesus in faith, in other words, take him at his word, trust him, that what he's saying is authentic and true, transformative, and love. Or you can reject Jesus. You can accept him into your heart. You can accept what he says is true. You can trust that. Or you can say no. Now, Marsh would go on to argue, and this is cogent. He would go on to argue that what is in the balance then, and, and if you watch the way this uh, sign is set up, this is crucial, is that it ends up being, whether you believe, trust, Jesus or not, ends up being a life and death consequence. consequences life or death. If the man doesn't choose to believe in Jesus, what's happened? What happens to the boy? He dies. Maybe. Probably. He dies. Um, so what Marsh is able to do, and he's, he's exactly right, he's able to say that when we look at this, we got the element of uh, trust or belief, if you like, you got the element of life, and they're really talking about life everlasting. And then you have the element of death, and by that he means death everlasting. And what is in this crucible are these ingredients. And so when you're confronted with the living gospel of Jesus Christ, it does matter how you respond. It does make a difference. If you're going to be cavalier about it, you're doomed. 
And this is something that people just don't get. People do not understand this. And what we do is we have mollycoddled Jesus, we have misunderstood Jesus, we do not understand that this is really serious stuff. And if there is something in the balance, and the way we behave, and the way we act, and the way we respond to who we call Lord and Savior, and the trust that we put in Jesus Christ does matter. And if you need a sign, you got problems. If you need proof, you got problems. If you need a miraculous wonder, you've got problems. Because that means you don't have trust in Jesus. I've said this before, if you have to have um, proof that there was uh, Noah's Ark, you're in sorry shape. Sorry, shape. So, the sign, it's kind of lovely here, that the boy, eh, it almost seems as if the boy is saved, yes, because of the miracle, and I do believe it happened, of Jesus. That Jesus, obviously, is the one that brings this boy to life saves him from dying. And yet it is the Father's trust in Jesus that seems to direct Jesus' efforts to bring this uh, miracle about. So then that faith or trust, faith, life, and death all go together in this lovely little story and, um, and worth our thinking about. That said, um, You'll go to your scriptures, you'll see the next miracle that's in there, and that's what we'll be talking about next week. Thank you so much. It's been a blessing, of course. And if you'd be so kind, Miriam, where are you? Are you going to help us sing this final hymn? Thank you. If you'd be so kind, please stand and we'll sing together, O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Number three.
We give thee thanks for the blessing of Jesus Christ who we meet every day. And let us be brave men and women and choose him. And watch the miracles unfold right before our eyes. I would ask also that God's blessing be upon those in this fellowship who are not well. And I would ask that God's blessing be upon every single person here, uh, now and forevermore. Amen.